English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 21 Child Roland Child Roland and his brothers twain were playing at the ball, and there was their sister Bird Ellen in the midst among them all. Child Roland kicked it with his foot and caught it with his knee. At last as he plunged among them all, o'er the church he made it flee. Bird Ellen round about the aisle to seek the ball is gone, but long they waited and longer still, and she came not back again. They sought her east, they sought her west, they sought her up and down, and woe were the hearts of those brethren, for she was not to be found. So at last her eldest brother went to the warlock Merlin and told him all the case, and asked him if he knew where Bird Ellen was. The fair bird Ellen, said Warlock Merlin, must have been carried off by the fairies, because she went round the church wider shins, the opposite way to the sun. She is now in the dark tower of the King of Elfland. It would take the boldest knight in Christendom to bring her back. If it is possible to bring her back, said her brother, I'll do it, or perish in the attempt. Possible it is, said the warlock Merlin, but woe to the man or mother's son that attempts it, if he is not well taught beforehand what he is to do. The eldest brother of Bird Ellen was not to be put off by any fear of danger from attempting to get her back, so he begged the warlock Merlin to tell him what he should do, and what he should not do, in going to seek his sister. And after he had been taught and had repeated his lesson, he set out for Elfland. But long they waited, and longer still, with doubt and muckle pain. But woe were the hearts of his brethren, for he came not back again. Then the second brother got tired and sick of waiting, and went to the warlock Merlin, and asked him the same as his brother. So he set out to find Bird Ellen. But long they waited, and longer still, with muckle doubt and pain, and woe were his mother's and brother's heart, for he came not back again. And when they had waited and waited a good long time, Child Roland, the youngest of Bird Ellen's brothers, wished to go, and went to his mother, the good queen, to ask her to let him go. But she would not at first, for he was the last of her children she now had, and if he was lost, all would be lost. But he begged and he begged, till at last the good queen let him go, and gave him his father's good brand that never struck in vain. And as she girt it round his waist, she said the spell that would give it victory. So Child Roland said good-bye to the good queen, his mother, and went to the cave of the warlock Merlin. Once more and but once more, he said to the warlock, Tell how man or mother's son may rescue Bird Ellen and her brothers twain. Well, my son, said the warlock Merlin, there are but two things, simple they may seem, but hard they are to do. One thing to do and one thing not to do. And the thing to do is this, after you have entered the land of fairy, whoever speaks to you till you meet the Bird Ellen, you must out with your father's brand, and off with their head. And what you've not to do is this. Bite no bit, and drink no drop, however hungry or thirsty you be. Drink a drop, or bite a bit, while in Elfland you be, and never will you see Middle Earth again. So Child Roland said the two things over and over again, till he knew them by heart. And he thanked the warlock Merlin, and went on his way. And he went along and along and along, and still further along, till he came to the horseherd of the king of Elfland, feeding his horses. These he knew by their fiery eyes, and knew that he was at last in the land of fairy. Canst thou tell me, said Child Roland, to the horseherd, where the king of Elfland's dark tower is? I cannot tell thee, said the horseherd, but go on a little further and thou wilt come to the cowherd, and he, maybe, can tell thee. Then, without a word more, Child Roland drew the good brand that never struck in vain, and off went the horseherd's head, 
and Child Roland went on further, till he came to the cowherd, and asked him the same question. "'I can't tell thee,' said he, "'but go on a little farther, and thou wilt come to the hen-wife, and she is sure to know.' Then Child Roland, out with his good brand, that never struck in vain, and off went the cowherd's head. And he went on a little further, till he came to an old woman in a grey cloak, and he asked her if she knew where the dark tower of the king of Elfland was. "'Go on a little further,' said the henwife, "'till you come to a round green hill, surrounded with terraced rings, from the bottom to the top. Go round it three times wider shins, and each time say, "'Open door, open door, and let me come in.' "'And the third time the door will open, and you may go in.' And Child Roland was just going on, when he remembered what he had to do. So he out with the good brand that never struck in vain, and off went the henwife's head. Then he went on and on and on, till he came to the round green hill with the terrace rings from top to bottom, and he went round it three times wider shins, saying each time, Open door, open door, and let me come in. And the third time the door did open, and he went in, and it closed with a click, and Child Roland was left in the dark. It was not exactly dark, but a kind of twilight or gloaming. There were neither windows nor candles, and he could not make out where the twilight came from, if not through the walls and roof. These were rough arches made of a transparent rock, encrusted with sheep silver and rock spar, and other bright stones. But though it was rock, the air was quite warm, as it always is in Elfland. So he went through this passage till at last he came to two wide and high folding doors which stood ajar. And when he opened them, there he saw a most wonderful and glorious sight, a large and spacious hall, so large that it seemed to be as long and as broad as the green hill itself. The roof was supported by fine pillars, so large and lofty that the pillars of a cathedral were as nothing to them. They were all of gold and silver, with fretted work, and between them and around them, wreaths of flowers, composed of, what do you think? Why, of diamonds and emeralds, and all manner of precious stones. And the very keystones of the arches had for ornaments clusters of diamonds and rubies and pearls, and other precious stones. And all these arches met in the middle of the roof, and just there, hung by a golden chain, an immense lamp made out of one big pearl hollowed out and quite transparent. And in the middle of this was a big, huge carbuncle, which kept spinning round and round, and this was what gave light by its rays to the whole hall, which seemed as if the setting sun was shining on it. The hall was furnished in a manner equally grand, and at one end of it was a glorious couch of velvet, silver and gold, and there sate Bird Ellen, combing her golden hair with a silver comb. And when she saw Child Roland, she stood up and said, God pity ye, poor luckless fool, what have ye here to do? Hear ye this, my youngest brother, why didn't ye bide at home? Had you a hundred thousand lives, ye couldn't spare any a one. But sit ye down, but woe, oh woe, that ever ye were born. For come the king of Elfland in, your fortune is forlorn. Then they sate down together, and Child Roland told her all that he had done. And she told him how their two brothers had reached the dark tower, but had been enchanted by the king of Elfland, and lay there entombed as if dead. And then after they had talked a little longer, Child Roland began to feel hungry from his long travels, and told his sister Bird Ellen how hungry he was, and asked for some food, forgetting all about the warlock Merlin's warning. Bird Ellen looked at Child Roland sadly and shook her head, but she was under a spell and could not warn him. So she rose up and went out, and soon brought back a golden basin full of bread and milk. 
Child Roland was just going to raise it to his lips, when he looked at his sister and remembered why he had come all that way. So he dashed the bowl to the ground and said, Not a sup will I swallow, nor a bit will I bite, till Bird Ellen is set free. Just at that moment they heard the noise of someone approaching, and a loud voice was heard saying, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of a Christian man. Be he dead, be he living, with my brand I'll dash his brains from his brain pan. And then the folding doors of the hall were burst open, and the king of Elfland rushed in. Strike then, Bogle, if thou darest, shouted out Child Roland, and rushed to meet him with his good brand that never yet did fail. They fought and they fought and they fought, till Child Roland beat the king of Elfland. English Fairy Tales, collected by Joseph Jacobs. Chapter 22. Molly Wuppy. Once upon a time, there was a man and a wife had too many children, and they could not get meat for them. So they took the three youngest, and left them in a wood. They travelled and travelled, and could see never a house. It began to be dark, and they were hungry. At last they saw a light and made for it. It turned out to be a house. They knocked at the door, and a woman came to it, who said, What do you want? They said, Please let us in, and give us something to eat. The woman said, I can't do that, as my man is a giant, and he would kill you if he comes home. They begged hard. Let us stop for a little while, said they, and we will go away before he comes. So she took them in, and set them down before the fire, and gave them milk and bread. But just as they had begun to eat, a great knock came to the door, and a dreadful voice said, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of some earthly one. Who have you there, wife? Eh, said the wife, it's three poor lassies, cold and hungry, and they will go away. You won't touch them, man. He said nothing, but ate up a big supper, and ordered them to stay all night. Now he had three lassies of his own, and they were to sleep in the same bed with the three strangers. The youngest of the three strange lassies was called Molly Wuppy, and she was very clever. She noticed that before they went to bed, the giant put straw ropes round her neck and her sister's, and round his own lassie's necks he put gold chains. So Molly took care, and did not fall asleep, but waited till she was sure every one was sleeping sound. Then she slipped out of the bed, and took the straw ropes off her own and her sister's necks, and took the gold chains off the giant's lassie's. She then put the straw ropes on the giant's lassie's, and the gold on herself and her sisters, and lay down. And in the middle of the night up rose the giant, armed with a great club, and he felt for the necks with the straw. It was dark. He took his own lassies out of bed, onto the floor, and battered them until they were dead, 
and then lay down again, thinking he had managed fine. Molly thought at times she and her sisters were out of that, so she wakened them and told them to be quiet, and they slipped out of the house. They all got out safe, and they ran and ran, and never stopped until morning, when they saw a grand house before them. It turned out to be a king's house, so Molly went in and told her story to the king. He said, Well, Molly, you are a clever girl, and you have managed well, but if you would manage better, and go back and steal the giant sword that hangs on the back of his bed, I would give your elder sister my eldest son to marry. Molly said she would try. So she went back and managed to slip into the giant's house and crept in below the bed. The giant came home and ate up a great supper and went to bed. Molly waited until he was snoring and she crept out and she reached over the giant and got down the sword. But just as she got it out over the bed, it gave a rattle, and up jumped the giant, and Molly ran out at the door, and the sword with her. And she ran, and he ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair. And she got over, but he couldn't. And he says, Woe worth ye, Molly Wuppy, never ye come again. And she says, Twice yet, Carl, quoth she, I'll come to Spain. So Molly took the sword to the king, and her sister was married to his son. Well, the king, he says, you've managed well, Molly, but if you would manage better, and steal the purse that lies below the giant's pillow, I would marry your second sister to my second son. And Molly said she would try. So she set out for the giant's house, and slipped in, and hid again below the bed and waited till the giant had eaten his supper, and was snoring sound asleep. She slipped out, and slipped her hand below the pillow, and got out the purse. But just as she was going out, the giant wakened, and ran after her, and she ran, and he ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair, and she got over, but he couldn't. And he said, Woe worth ye, Molly Wuppy, never you come again. Once yet, Carl, quoth she, I'll come to Spain. So Molly took the purse to the king, and her second sister was married to the king's second son. After that, the king says to Molly, Molly, you are a clever girl, but if you would do better yet, and steal the giant's ring that he wears on his finger, I will give you my youngest son for yourself. Molly said she would try. So back she goes to the giant's house, and hides herself below the bed. The giant wasn't long ere he came home, and after he had eaten a great big supper, he went to his bed, and shortly was snoring loud. Molly crept out, and reached over the bed, and got hold of the giant's hand, and she pulled and she pulled, until she got off the ring. But just as she got it off, the giant got up, and gripped her by the hand, and he says, now I have catched you, Molly Wuppy, and if I had done as much ill to you as ye have done to me, what would ye do to me? Molly says, I would put you into a sack, and I'd put the cat inside with you, and the dog aside you, and a needle and thread and a shears, and I'd hang you up upon the wall, and I'd go to the wood, and choose the thickest stick I could get, and I would come home, and take you down, and bang you till you were dead. Well, Molly, says the giant, I'll just do that to you. So he gets a sack and puts Molly into it, and the cat and the dog beside her, and a needle and thread and shears, and hangs her upon the wall, and goes to the wood to choose a stick. Molly, she sings out, Oh, if you see what I see. Oh, says the giant's wife, what do ye see, Molly? But Molly never said a word, but, Oh, ye see what I see. The giant's wife begged that Molly would take her up into the sack till she would see what Molly saw. So Molly took the shears and cut a hole in the sack 
and took out the needle and thread with her, and jumped down and helped, the giant's wife up into the sack, and sewed up the hole. The giant's wife saw nothing, and began to ask to get down again. But Molly never minded, and hid herself at the back of the door. Home came the giant, and a great big tree in his hand, and he took down the sack and began to batter it. His wife cried, "'It's me, man!' But the dog barked, and the cat mewed, and he did not know his wife's voice. But Molly came out from the back of the door, and the giant saw her, and he after her, and he ran, and she ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair. And she got over, but he couldn't. And he said, "'Woe worth you, Molly Whuppy! Never you come again!' Never more, Carl, quoth she, will I come again to Spain. So Molly took the ring to the king, and she was married to his youngest son, and she never saw the giant again. End of chapter 22. Molly Wuppy. English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs. Chapter 23. The Red Etten. There was once a widow that lived on a small bit of ground which she rented from a farmer, and she had two sons, and by and by it was time for the wife to send them away to seek their fortune. So she told her eldest son one day to take a can and bring her water from the well, that she might bake a cake for him, and however much or however little he might bring, the cake would be great or small accordingly, and that cake was to be all that she could give him when he went on his travels. The lad went away with the can to the well, and filled it with water, and then came away home again. But the can being broken, the most part of the water had run out before he got back. So his cake was very small. Yet small as it was, his mother asked him if he was willing to take the half of it with her blessing, telling him that if he chose rather to take the whole, he would only get it with her curse. The young man, thinking he might have to travel a far way, and not knowing when or how he might get other provisions, said he would like to have the whole cake, come of his mother's malice and what like. So she gave him the whole cake and her malice and along with it. Then he took his brother aside and gave him a knife to keep till he should come back, desiring him to look at it every morning, and as long as it continued to be clear, then he might be sure that the owner of it was well. But if it grew dim and rusty, then for certain some ill had befallen him. So the young man went to seek his fortune, and he went all that day, and all the next day, and on the third day in the afternoon he came up to where a shepherd was sitting with a flock of sheep, and he went up to the shepherd and asked him who the sheep belonged to, and he answered, The Red Etten of Ireland once lived in Balligan, and stole King Markham's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he strikes her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's one predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and long may it be so. This shepherd also told him to beware of the beasts he should next meet, for they were of a very different kind from any he had yet seen. So the young man went on, and by and by he saw a multitude of very dreadful beasts with two heads, and on every head four horns. And he was sore frightened, and ran away from them as fast as he could. And glad was he when he came to a castle that stood on a hillock, with the door standing wide open to the wall. And he went into the castle for shelter, and there he saw an old wife sitting beside the kitchen fire. He asked the wife if he might stay for the night, as he was tired with a long journey, and the wife said he might, but it was not a good place for him to be in, as it belonged to the Red Etten, who was a very terrible beast, with three heads that spared no living man it could get hold of. The young man would have gone away, but he was afraid of the beasts on the outside of the castle, so he beseeched the old woman to hide him as best she could, and not tell the Etten he was there. He thought, if he could put over the night, he might get away in the morning without meeting with the beasts, and so escape. But he had not been long in his hiding-hole, before the awful Etten came in, 
and no sooner was he in than he was heard crying, Snark but and snark ben, I find the smell of an earthly man, be he living or be he dead, his heart this night shall kitchen my bread. The monster soon found the poor young man, and pulled him from his hole, and when he had got him out, he told him that if he could answer him three questions, his life should be spared. So the first head asked, A thing without an end, what's that? But the young man knew not. Then the second head said, The smaller, the more dangerous, what's that? But the young man knew it not. And then the third head asked, The dead carrying the living, riddle me that. But the young man had to give it up. The lad not being able to answer one of these questions, the red Etten took a mallet and knocked him on the head and turned him into a pillar of stone. On the morning after this happened, the younger brother took out the knife to look at it, and he was grieved to find it all brown with rust. He told his mother that the time was now come for him to go away upon his travels also. So she requested him to take the can to the well for water, that she might make a cake for him. And he went, and as he was bringing home the water, a raven over his head cried to him to look, and he would see that the water was running out. And he was a young man of sense, and seeing the water running out, he took some clay and patched up the holes, so that he brought home enough water to bake a large cake. When his mother put it to him to take the hearth cake with her blessing, he took it in preference to having the hole with her malison, and yet the half was bigger than what the other lad had got. So he went away on his journey, and after he had travelled a far way, he met with an old woman that asked him if he would give her a bit of his johnny cake. And he said, I will gladly do that. And so he gave her a piece of the johnny cake, and for that she gave him a magical wand that she might yet be of service to him, if he took care to use it rightly. Then the old woman, who was a fairy, told him a great deal that would happen to him, and what he ought to do in all circumstances. And after that she vanished in an instant out of his sight. He went on a great way farther, and then he came up to the old man herding the sheep. And when he asked whose sheep these were, the answer was, The Red Etten of Ireland once lived in Balligan, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he strikes her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. But now I fear his end is near, and destiny at hand, and you're to be, I plainly see, the heir of all his land. When he came to the place where the monstrous beasts were standing, he did not stop nor run away, but went boldly through amongst them. One came up roaring with open mouth to devour him, when he struck it with his wand, and laid it in an instant dead at his feet. He soon came to the Etten's castle where he knocked, and was admitted. The old woman who sat by the fire warned him of the terrible Etten, and what had been the fate of his brother. But he was not to be daunted. The monster soon came in, saying, Snock but and snock ben, I find the smell of an earthly man. Be he living or be he dead, his heart shall be kitchen to my bread. He quickly espied the young man, and bade him come forth on the floor. And then he put the three questions to him. But the young man had been told everything by the good fairy, so he was able to answer all the questions. So when the first head asked, What's the thing without an end? He said, A bowl. And when the second head said, the smaller the more dangerous. What's that? He said at once, A bridge. And last, the third head said, When does the dead carry the living? Riddle me that. Then the young man answered up at once and said, When a ship sails on the sea with men inside her. When the Etten found this, he knew that his power was gone. The young man then took up an axe and hewed off the monster's three heads, he next asked the old woman to show him where the king's daughter lay, and the old woman took him upstairs and opened a great many doors, and out of every door came a beautiful lady who had been imprisoned there by the Etten. And one of the ladies was the king's daughter. She also took him down into a low room, 
and there stood a stone pillar that he had only to touch with his wand when his brother started into life. And the whole of the prisoners were overjoyed at their deliverance, for which they thanked the young man. Next day they all set out for the king's court, and a gallant company they made. And the king married his daughter to the young man that had delivered her, and gave a noble's daughter to his brother. And so they all lived happily all the rest of their days. End of chapter 23 The Red Etten English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 24 The Golden Arm he was once a man who travelled the land all over in search of a wife. He saw young and old, rich and poor, pretty and plain, and could not meet with one to his mind. At last he found a woman, young, fair and rich, who possessed a right arm of solid gold. He married her at once, and thought no man so fortunate as he was. They lived happily together, but, though he wished people to think otherwise, he was fonder of the golden arm, than of all his wife's gifts besides. At last she died. The husband put on the blackest black and pulled the longest face at the funeral. But for all that he got up in the middle of the night, dug up the body and cut off the golden arm. He hurried home to hide his treasure and thought no one would know. The following night he put the golden arm under his pillow and was just falling asleep when the ghost of his dead wife glided into the room. Stalking up to the bedside, it drew the curtain and looked at him reproachfully. Pretending not to be afraid, he spoke to the ghost and said, What hast thou done with thy cheeks so red? All withered and wasted away, replied the ghost in a hollow tone. What hast thou done with thy red rosy lips? All withered and wasted away. What hast thou done with thy golden hair? All withered and wasted away. What hast thou done with thy golden arm? Thou hast it! End of chapter 24 The Golden Arm English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 25 The History of Tom Thumb In the days of the great Prince Arthur, there lived a mighty magician called Merlin, the most learned and skilful enchanter the world has ever seen. This famous magician, who could take any form he pleased, was travelling about as a poor beggar, and being very tired, he stopped at the cottage of a ploughman to rest himself, and asked for some food. The countryman bade him welcome, and his wife, who was a very good-hearted woman, soon brought him some milk in a wooden bowl, and some coarse brown bread on a platter. Merlin was much pleased with the kindness of the ploughman and his wife, but he could not help noticing that though everything was neat and comfortable in the cottage, they seemed both to be very unhappy. He therefore asked them why they were so melancholy, and learned that they were miserable because they had no children. The poor woman said with tears in her eyes, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. Although he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Merlin was so much amused with the idea of a boy no bigger than a man's thumb that he determined to grant the poor woman's wish. Accordingly, in a short time after, the ploughman's wife had a son who, wonderful to relate, was not a bit bigger than his father's thumb. The queen of the fairies, wishing to see the little fellow, came in at the window while the mother was sitting up in the bed admiring him. The queen kissed the child and, giving it the name of Tom Thumb, sent for some of the fairies who dressed her little godson according to her orders. An oak-leaf hat he had for his crown, his shirt of web by spiders spun, with jacket wove of thistles down, his trousers were of feathers done. His stockings of apple rind they tie, with eyelash from his mother's eye. His shoes were made of mouse's skin, tanned with the downy hair within. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb, which was only of ordinary size. But as he got older, 
he became very cunning and full of tricks. When he was old enough to play with the boys and had lost all his own cherry stones, he used to creep into the bags of his playfellows, fill his pockets, and, getting out without their noticing him, would again join in the game. One day, however, as he was coming out of a bag of cherry stones where he had been stealing as usual, the boy to whom it belonged chanced to see him. Aha, my little Tommy, said the boy, so I have caught you stealing my cherry stones at last, and you shall be rewarded for your thievish tricks. On saying this, he drew the string tight round his neck and gave the bag such a hearty shake that poor little Tom's legs, thighs and body was sadly bruised. He roared out with pain and begged to be let out, promising never to steal again. A short time afterwards, his mother was making a batter pudding, and Tom, being very anxious to see how it was made, climbed up to the edge of the bowl, but his foot slipped, and he plumped over head and ears into the batter, without his mother noticing him, who stirred him into the pudding bag, and put him in the pot to boil. The batter filled Tom's mouth and prevented him from crying, but on feeling the hot water he kicked and struggled so much in the pot that his mother thought that the pudding was bewitched, and pulling it out of the pot she threw it outside the door. A poor tinker who was passing by lifted up the pudding, and putting it into his budget he then walked off. As Tom had now got his mouth cleared of the batter, he then began to cry aloud, which so frightened the tinker that he flung down the pudding and ran away. The pudding being broke to pieces by the fall, Tom crept out, covered all over with the batter, and walked home. His mother, who was very sorry to see her darling in such a woeful state, put him into a teacup, and soon washed off the batter, after which she kissed him and laid him in bed. Soon after the adventure of the pudding, Tom's mother went to milk her cow in the meadow, and she took him along with her. As the wind was very high, for fear of being blown away, she tied him to a thistle with a piece of fine thread. The cow soon observed Tom's oak-leaf hat, and liking the appearance of it, took poor Tom and the thistle at one mouthful. While the cow was chewing the thistle, Tom was afraid of her great teeth, which threatened to crush him in pieces and he roared out as loud as he could, Mother! Mother! Where are you, Tommy? My dear Tommy, said his mother. Here, mother, replied he, in the red cow's mouth. His mother began to cry and wring her hands, but the cow, surprised at the odd noise in her throat, opened her mouth and let Tom drop out. Fortunately, his mother caught him in her apron as he was falling to the ground or he would have been dreadfully hurt. She then put Tom in her bosom and ran home with him. Tom's father made him a whip of a barley straw to drive the cattle with, and having one day gone into the fields, he slipped a foot and rolled into the furrow. A raven which was flying over picked him up and flew with him over the sea, and there dropped him. A large fish swallowed Tom the moment he fell into the sea, which was soon after caught and brought for the table of King Arthur. When they opened the fish in order to cook it, every one was astonished at finding such a little boy, and Tom was quite delighted at being free again. They carried him to the king who made Tom his dwarf, and he soon grew a great favourite at court, for by his tricks and gambles he not only amused the king and queen, but also all the knights of the round table. It is said that when the king rode out on horseback, he often took Tom along with him, and if a shower came on, he used to creep into his majesty's waistcoat pocket, where he slept till the rain was over. King Arthur one day asked Tom about his parents, wishing to know if they were as small as he was, and whether they were well off. Tom told the king that his father and mother were as tall as anybody about the court but in rather poor circumstances. On hearing this, the king carried Tom to his treasury, 
the place where he kept all his money, and told him to take as much money as he could carry home to his parents, which made the poor little fellow caper with joy. Tom went immediately to procure a purse, which was made of a water bubble, and then returned to the treasury, where he received a silver threepenny piece to put into it. Our little hero had some difficulty in lifting the burden upon his back, but he at last succeeded in getting it placed to his mind, and set forward on his journey. However, without meeting with any accident, and after resting himself more than a hundred times by the way, in two days and two nights he reached his father's house in safety. Tom had travelled forty-eight hours with a huge silver piece on his back, and was almost tired to death when his mother ran out to meet him and carried him into the house. But he soon returned to court. As Tom's clothes had suffered much in the batter pudding and the inside of the fish, His Majesty ordered him a new suit of clothes, and to be mounted as a knight on a mouse. Of butterflies' wings his shirt was made, his boots of chickens' hides, and by a nimble fairy blade, well learned in the tailoring trade, his clothing was supplied. A needle dangled by his side, a dapper mouse he used to ride. Thus strutted Tom in stately pride. It was certainly very diverting to see Tom in this dress and mounted on the mouse as he rode out a hunting with the king and nobility, who were all ready to expire with laughter at Tom and his fine prancing charger. The king was so charmed with his address that he ordered a little chair to be made in order that Tom might sit upon his table and also a palace of gold a span high with a door an inch wide, to live in. He also gave him a coach drawn by six small mice. The Queen was so enraged at the honours conferred on Sir Thomas that she resolved to ruin him, and told the King that the little knight had been saucy to her. The King sent for Tom in great haste, but being fully aware of the danger of royal anger, he crept into an empty snail shell, where he lay for a long time, until he was almost starved with hunger. But at last he ventured to peep out, and seeing a fine large butterfly on the ground, near the place of his concealment, he got close to it, and jumping astride on it, was carried up into the air. The butterfly flew with him from tree to tree, and from field to field, and at last returned to the court, where the king and nobility all strove to catch him. But at last poor Tom fell from his seat into a watering pot, in which he was almost drowned. When the Queen saw him she was in a rage, and said he should be beheaded, and he was again put into a mousetrap until the time of his execution. However, a cat, observing something alive in the trap, patted it about till the wires broke, and set Thomas at liberty. The King received Tom again into favour, English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 26 Mr. Fox Lady Mary was young, 
and Lady Mary was fair. She had two brothers and more lovers than she could count, but of them all the bravest and most gallant was a Mr. Fox whom she met when she was down at her father's country house. No one knew who Mr. Fox was, but he was certainly brave and surely rich, and of all her lovers Lady Mary cared for him alone. At last it was agreed upon between them that they should be married. Lady Mary asked Mr. Fox where they should live, and he described to her his castle and where it was, but strange to say did not ask her or her brothers to come and see it. So one day, near the wedding day, when her brothers were out, and Mr. Fox was away for a day or two on business, as he said, Lady Mary set out for Mr. Fox's castle. And after many searchings, she came at last to it, and a fine, strong house it was, with high walls and a deep moat. And when she came up to the gateway, she saw written on it, Be bold, be bold. But as the gate was open, she went through it, and found no one there. So she went up to the doorway, and over it she found written, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold. Still she went on, till she came into the hall, and went up the broad stairs, till she came to a door in the gallery, over which was written, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, lest that your heart's blood should run cold. But Lady Mary was a brave one, she was, and she opened the door, and what do you think she saw? Why, bodies and skeletons of beautiful young ladies, all stained with blood. So Lady Mary thought it was high time to get out of that horrid place, and she closed the door, went through the gallery, and was just going down the stairs and out of the hall, when who should she see through the window but Mr. Fox dragging a beautiful young lady along from the gateway to the door. Lady Mary rushed downstairs and hid herself behind a cask, just in time as Mr. Fox came in with the poor young lady who seemed to have fainted. Just as he got near Lady Mary, Mr. Fox saw a diamond ring glittering on the finger of the young lady he was dragging, and he tried to pull it off. But it was tightly fixed and would not come off. So Mr. Fox cursed and swore, and drew his sword and raised it, and brought it down upon the hand of the poor lady. The sword cut off the hand which jumped up into the air, and fell of all places in the world into Lady Mary's lap. Mr. Fox looked about a bit, but did not think of looking behind the cask. So at last he went on dragging the young lady up the stairs into the bloody chamber. As soon as she heard him pass through the gallery, Lady Mary crept out of the door, down through the gateway, and ran home as fast as she could. Now it happened that the very next day the marriage contract of Lady Mary and Mr. Fox was to be signed, and there was a splendid breakfast before that. And when Mr. Fox was seated at table opposite Lady Mary, he looked at her. "'How pale you are this morning, my dear.' "'Yes,' said she. "'I had a bad night's rest last night. I had horrible dreams.' "'Dreams go by contraries,' said Mr. Fox. "'But tell us your dream, and your sweet voice will make the time pass till the happy hour comes.' "'I dreamed,' said Lady Mary.' that I went yestermorn to your castle, and I found it in the woods with high walls and a deep moat, and over the gateway was written, Be bold, be bold. But it is not so, nor it was not so, said Mr. Fox. And when I came to the doorway, over it was written, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold. It is not so, nor it was not so, said Mr. Fox. And then I went upstairs, and came to a gallery, at the end of which was a door, on which was written, Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, lest that your heart's blood should run cold. It is not so, nor it was not so, said Mr. Fox. And then, and then I opened the door, and the room was filled with bodies and skeletons of poor dead women, all stained with their blood. It is not so, nor it was not so, and God forbid it should be so, said Mr. Fox. I then dreamed that I rushed down the gallery, 
and just as I was going down the stairs, I saw you, Mr. Fox, coming up to the hall door, dragging after you a poor, young lady, rich and beautiful. "'It is not so, nor it was not so, and God forbid it should be so,' said Mr. Fox. "'I rushed downstairs just in time to hide myself behind a cask, when you, Mr. Fox, came in dragging the young lady by the arm, and as you passed me, Mr. Fox, I thought I saw you try and get off her diamond ring, and when you could not, Mr. Fox, it seemed to me in my dream that you out with your sword and hacked off the poor lady's hand to get the ring. "'It is not so, nor it was not so, and God forbid it should be so,' said Mr. Fox, and was going to say something else as he rose from his seat, when Lady Mary cried out, "'But it is so, and it was so. "'Here's hand and ring I have to show,' "'and pulled out the lady's hand from her dress "'and pointed it straight at Mr. Fox. "'At once her brothers and her friends drew their swords "'and cut Mr. Fox into a thousand pieces. "'End of chapter 26, Mr. Fox.' English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 27 Lazy Jack Once upon a time there was a boy whose name was Jack, and he lived with his mother on a common. They were very poor, and the old woman got her living by spinning. But Jack was so lazy that he would do nothing but bask in the sun in the hot weather, and sit by the corner of the hearth in the winter time. So they called him Lazy Jack. His mother could not get him to do anything for her, and at last told him one Monday that if he did not begin to work for his porridge, she would turn him out to get his living as he could. This roused Jack, and he went out and hired himself for the next day to a neighbouring farmer for a penny. But as he was coming home, never having had any money before, he lost it in passing over a brook. "'You stupid boy,' said his mother. "'You should have put it in your pocket.' "'I'll do so another time,' replied Jack. "'On Wednesday, Jack went out again "'and hired himself to a cowkeeper, "'who gave him a jar of milk for his day's work. "'Jack took the jar and put it into the large pocket of his jacket, "'spilling it all long before he got home. "'Dear me,' said the old woman, you should have carried it on your head. I'll do so another time, said Jack. So on Thursday, Jack hired himself again to a farmer, who agreed to give him a cream cheese for his services. In the evening, Jack took the cheese and went home with it on his head. By the time he got home, the cheese was all spoilt, part of it being lost and part matted with his hair. "'You stupid lout!' said his mother. "'You should have carried it very carefully in your hands.' "'I'll do so another time,' replied Jack. "'On Friday, Lazy Jack again went out "'and hired himself to a baker "'who would give him nothing for his work "'but a large tomcat. "'Jack took the cat and began carrying it "'very carefully in his hands.' but in a short time Pussy scratched him so much that he was compelled to let it go. When he got home, his mother said to him, "'You silly fellow! You should have tied it with a string and dragged it along after you!' "'I'll do so another time,' said Jack. So on Saturday, Jack hired himself to a butcher, who rewarded him by the handsome present of a shoulder of mutton. Jack took the mutton, tied it to a string, and trailed it along after him in the dirt, so that by the time he had got home, the meat was completely spoiled. His mother was this time quite out of patience with him, for the next day was Sunday, and she was obliged to make do with cabbage for her dinner. "'You ninny-hammer,' said she to her son, "'you should have carried it on your shoulder.' "'I'll do so another time,' replied Jack. On the next Monday, Lazy Jack went once more and hired himself to a cattle-keeper, who gave him a donkey for his trouble. Jack found it hard to hoist the donkey on his shoulders, 
but at last he did it, and began walking slowly home with his prize. Now it happened that in the course of his journey there lived a rich man with his only daughter, a beautiful girl, but deaf and dumb. Now she had never laughed in her life, and the doctors said she would never speak till somebody made her laugh. This young lady happened to be looking out of the window when Jack was passing with the donkey on his shoulders, with the legs sticking up in the air, and the sight was so comical and strange that she burst out into a great fit of laughter and immediately recovered her speech and English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 28 Johnny Cake Once upon a time there was an old man and an old woman and a little boy. One morning the old woman made a johnny cake and put it in the oven to bake. You watch the johnny cake while your father and I go out to work in the garden. So the old man and the old woman went out and began to hoe potatoes and left the little boy to tend the oven. But he didn't watch it all the time, and all of a sudden he heard a noise, and he looked up, and the oven door popped open, and out of the oven jumped Johnny Cake, and went rolling along end over end towards the open door of the house. The little boy ran to shut the door, but Johnny Cake was too quick for him, and rolled through the door, down the steps, and out into the road long before the little boy could catch him. The little boy ran after him as fast as he could clip it crying out to his father and mother, who heard the uproar, and threw down their hoes and gave chase, too. But Johnny Cake outran all three a long way, and was soon out of sight, while they had to sit down, all out of breath, on a bank to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to two well-diggers who looked up from their work and called out, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' he said. I've outrun an old man, an old woman, and a little boy, and I can outrun you too. You can, can ye? We'll see about that, said they. And they threw down their picks and ran after him, but couldn't catch up with him, and soon they had to sit down by the roadside to rest. On ran Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to two ditch diggers who were digging a ditch. Where are you going, Johnny Cake? said they. He said, I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers, and I can outrun you too. You can, can you? We'll see about that, said they. And they threw down their spades and ran after him too. But Johnny Cake soon outstripped them also, and seeing they could never catch him, they gave up the chase and sat down to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a bear. The bear said, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' he said. "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, "'and two well-diggers, and two ditch-diggers, and I can outrun you too!' "'You can, can ye?' growled the bear. "'We'll see about that!' and trotted as fast as his legs could carry him after Johnny Cake, "'who never stopped to look behind him. "'Before long the bear was left so far behind "'that he saw he might as well give up the hunt first as last.' so he stretched himself out by the roadside to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a wolf. The wolf said, "'Where are ye going, Johnny Cake?' He said, "'I've outrun an old man, and an old woman, and a little boy, and two well-diggers, and two ditch-diggers, and a bear, and I can outrun you too!' "'Ye can, can ye?' snarled the wolf. "'We'll see about that!' and he set into a gallop after Johnny Cake, who went on and on so fast that the wolf, too, saw there was no hope of overtaking him, and he, too, lay down to rest. On went Johnny Cake, and by and by he came to a fox that lay quietly in a corner of the fence. The fox called out in a sharp voice, but without getting up, "'Where are you going, Johnny Cake?' 
he said. I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers and two ditch diggers, a bear and a wolf, and I can outrun you too. The fox said, Can't quite hear you, Johnny Cake. Won't you come a little closer? Turning his head a little to one side. Johnny Cake stopped his race for the first time and went a little closer and called out in a very loud voice. I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers and two ditch diggers and a bear and a wolf and I can outrun you too. Can't quite hear you. Won't you come a little closer, said the fox in a feeble voice as he stretched out his neck towards Johnny Cake and put one paw behind his ear. Johnny Cake came up close and leaning towards the fox screamed out, I've outrun an old man and an old woman and a little boy and two well diggers and two ditch diggers and a bear and a wolf and I can outrun you too. You can, can you, yelped the fox, and he snapped up the johnny cake in his sharp teeth in the twinkling of an eye. End of chapter 28 Johnny Cake English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 29 Earl Mar's Daughter One fine summer's day, Earl Mar's daughter went into the castle garden, dancing and tripping along, and as she played and sported, she would stop from time to time to listen to the music of the birds. After a while, as she sat under the shade of a green oak tree, she looked up and spied a sprightly dove sitting high up on one of its branches. She looked up and said, "'Coo, my dove, my dear, come down to me and I will give you a golden cage. I'll take you home and pet you well, as well as any bird of them all.' Scarcely had she said these words when the dove flew down from the branch and settled on her shoulder, nestling up against her neck while she smoothed its feathers. Then she took it home to her own room. The day was done and the night came on, and Earl Mar's daughter was thinking of going to sleep when, turning round, she found at her side a handsome young man. She was startled, for the door had been locked for hours. But she was a brave girl, and said, "'What are you doing here, young man, to come and startle me so? The door was barred these hours ago. However did you come here?' "'Hush, hush,' the young man whispered. "'I was that cooing dove that you coaxed from off the tree.' "'But who are you, then?' she said, quite low. "'And how came you to be changed into that dear little bird?' "'My name is Florentine, and my mother is a queen, "'and something more than a queen, for she knows magic and spells, "'and because I would not do as she wished, "'she turned me into a dove by day. "'But at night her spells lose their power, and I become a man again. "'Today I crossed the sea, and saw you for the first time, "'and I was glad to be a bird that I could come near you.' Unless you love me, I shall never be happy more. But if I love you, says she, will you not fly away and leave me one of these fine days? Never, never, said the prince. Be my wife, and I'll be yours for ever. By day a bird, by night a prince. I will always be by your side as a husband, dear. So they were married in secret, and lived happily in the castle, and no one knew that every night my dove became Prince Florentine, and every year a little son came to them, as bonny as bonny could be. But as each son was born, Prince Florentine carried the little thing away on his back, over the sea, to where the queen his mother lived, and left the little one with her. Seven years passed thus, and then a great trouble came to them, for the Earl Ma wished to marry his daughter to a noble of high degree who came wooing her. Her father pressed her sore, but she said, "'Father, dear, I do not wish to marry. I can be quite happy with Kumai Dove here.' Then her father got into a mighty rage and saw a great big oath and said, "'Tomorrow, so sure as I live and eat, I'll twist that birdie's neck.' And out he stamped from her room. "'Oh, oh!' said Kumai Dove. "'It's time that I was away.' And so he jumped upon the window sill and in a moment was flying away. And he flew and he flew till he was over the deep, deep sea. 
and yet on he flew till he came to his mother's castle. Now the queen, his mother, was taking her walk abroad, when she saw the pretty dove flying overhead and alighting on the castle walls. "'Here, dancers, come and dance your jigs,' she called, "'and pipers, pipe you well, for here's my own Florentine. Come back to me to stay, for he's brought no bonny boy with him this time.' "'No, mother,' said Florentine, "'no dancers for me and no minstrels, for my dear wife,' The mother of my seven boys is to be wed tomorrow, and sad's the day for me. What can I do, my son? said the queen. Tell me, and it shall be done if my magic has the power to do it. Well then, mother dear, turn the twenty-four dancers and pipers into twenty-four grey herons, and let my seven sons become seven white swans, and let me be a goshawk and their leader. Alas, alas, my son, she said. That may not be. My magic reaches not so far. But perhaps my teacher, the spaywife of Ostri, may know better. And away she hurries to the cave of Ostri, and after a while comes out as white as white can be, and muttering over some burning herbs she brought out of the cave. Suddenly, Kumaidove changed into a goshawk, and around him flew twenty-four grey herons, and above them flew seven cygnets. Without a word or a good-bye, off they flew over the deep blue sea, which was tossing and moaning. They flew and they flew, till they swooped down on Earl Mar's castle, just as the wedding party were setting off for the church. First came the men-at-arms, and then the bridegroom's friends, and then Earl Mar's men, and then the bridegroom, and lastly, pale and beautiful, Earl Mar's daughter herself. They moved down slowly to stately music, till they came past the trees on which the birds were settling. A word from Prince Florentine, the goshawk, and they all rose into the air, herons beneath, cygnets above, and goshawk circling above all. The Wedeneers wondered at the sight when, swoop, the herons were down among them, scattering the men-at-arms. The swanlets took charge of the bride, while the goshawk dashed down and tied the bridegroom to a tree. Then the herons gathered themselves together into one feather-bed, and the signets placed their mother upon them, and suddenly they all rose in the air, bearing the bride away with them in safety towards Prince Florentine's home. Surely a wedding party was never so disturbed in this world. What could the weddineers do? They saw their pretty bride carried away and away, till she and the herons and the swans and the goshawk disappeared, and that very day Prince Florentine brought Earl Mar's daughter to the castle of the queen, his mother, who took the spell off him, and they lived happy ever afterwards. End of chapter 29 Earl Mar's Daughter English Fairy Tales Collected by Joseph Jacobs Chapter 30 Mr. Miyaka Tommy Grimes was sometimes a good boy, and sometimes a bad boy, and when he was a bad boy, he was a very bad boy. Now his mother used to say to him, Tommy, Tommy, be a good boy, and don't go out of the street, or else Mr. Miyaka will take you. But still, when he was a bad boy, he would go out of the street, and one day, sure enough, he had scarcely got round the corner, when Mr. Miyaka did catch him, and popped him into a bag upside down, and took him off to his house. When Mr. Miyaka got Tommy inside, he pulled him out of the bag and set him down, and felt his arms and legs. "'You're rather tough,' says he. "'But you're all I've got for supper, and you'll not taste bad boiled. But body o' me, I forgot the herbs, and it's bitter you'll taste without herbs. Sally! Here I say, Sally!' and he called Mrs. Miyaka. So Mrs. Miyaka came out of another room and said, "'What do you want, my dear?' "'Oh, here's a little boy for supper,' said Mr. Miyaka, "'and I forgot the herbs. "'Mind him, will ye, while I go for them?' "'All right, my love,' says Mrs. Miyaka, "'and off he goes.' Then Tommy Grimes said to Mrs. Miyaka, does Mr. Miyaka always have little boys for supper? Mostly, my dear, said Mrs. Miyaka. 
"'If little boys are bad enough and get in his way.' "'And don't you have anything else but boy meat? "'No pudding?' asked Tommy. "'I loves pudding,' says Mrs. Miyaka. "'But it's not often the likes of me gets pudding.' "'Why, my mother is making a pudding this very day,' said Tommy Grimes, "'and I'm sure she'd give you some if I ask her. "'Shall I run and get some?' "'Now that's a thoughtful boy,' said Mrs. Miyaka. "'Only don't be long and be sure to be back for supper.' "'So off Tommy pelters, and right glad he was to get off so cheap. "'And for many a long day he was as good as good could be, "'and never went round the corner of the street. "'But he couldn't always be good, "'and one day he went round the corner, and as luck would have it, he hadn't scarcely got round it when Mr. Miyaka grabbed him up, popped him in his bag, and took him home. When he got him there, Mr. Miyaka dropped him out, and when he saw him, he said, "'Ah, you're the youngster what served me and my missus that shabby trick, leaving us without any supper. Well, you shan't do it again. I'll watch over you myself. Here, get under the sofa, and I'll set on it and watch the pot boil for you.' So poor Tommy Grimes had to creep under the sofa, and Mr. Miyaka sat on it and waited for the pot to boil. And they waited and they waited, but still the pot didn't boil, till at last Mr. Miyaka got tired of waiting, and he said, Here, you under there, I'm not going to wait any longer. Put out your leg and I'll stop your giving us the slip. So Tommy put out a leg, and Mr. Miyaka got a chopper and chopped it off and pops it in the pot. Suddenly he calls out, Sally, my dear, Sally, and nobody answered. So he went into the next room to look out for Mrs. Miyaka, and while he was there, Tommy